This is Josh White with JW Math Tutoring. Today's video is going to go through the calculator section of the April 2022 uh, QAS school day test. Um, if you missed the uh, previous video, which had the solutions to the no calculator section or section three of the math portion of this test, you know, please uh, look for the link on uh, that video. It'll be in the description below. But otherwise, uh, this video is going to go through all 38 problems, like I said, from the calculator section. And just to be aware, I state this at pretty much the start of every video, but for a lot of these problems, uh, I show multiple solutions and multiple methods to how you can solve them, including using a graphing calculator where applicable. So uh, what that means is this video may be a lot longer than some of the other explanation or solution videos out there. So this is not a video that's going to show you exactly how quickly you need to complete, you know, each question in in order to, you know, finish all 38 questions within the 55 minutes. But instead, I'm going to take the time to go through and maybe talk about the topics a little more, you know, in depth um, and or, like I said, show you multiple methods that you can use to solve these problems. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started on the calculator section of the April 2022 QAS math part. But life is a dream the calculus could never predict. Okay, ready to start going through the calculator section of the April 2022 um, QAS uh, SAT test. First thing, just before I begin, of course, if you like this video, please click the like button uh, and also uh, subscribe to my channel and sign up for notifications as well. So that way you'll find out uh, whenever I post another math related video. Okay, so starting off with question number one, this is just a fairly basic question related to uh, linear equations. So all you have to do to start off on this one is just subtract 2x on both sides, you know, the normal step you would do if you're going to solve it, and you just get 6x equals 12. So which equation has the same solution as the one we're given? Well, it's obviously just going to be letter D, 6x equals 12, and that's it. No other work uh, to do. Now, for the second one, uh, you're just asked to evaluate this function for the value of 1. That's what uh, k of 1 means. So we'll go ahead and we'll just plug in 1 for x, and then we'll do uh, order of operations and simplify it. So on the top, 3 times 1 is 3. 3 minus 5 is negative 2. On the bottom, 2 times 1 is 2, and 2 plus 3 is 5. So we get negative 2 fifths. So letter C is the correct answer. However, I do want to show you just real quick how you can put this in on the calculator, including how to enter it uh, vertically. The, uh, in, in other words, in the same manner that you see it uh, listed on, on the paper. So I'm on my TI-84 plus uh, C uh, model calculator. I go to alpha y equals, and I select n over d to get a fraction. And now for the top, I'm just going to type out exactly you know what I had written there, 3 times 1 minus 5. Then I'll go to the denominator, and I'll type the same thing, 2 times 1 plus 3. And now I will just hit Enter. And I've got the, an the answer as a fraction. Negative 2 fifths match what I did just by hand. You could also type in this fraction horizontally on the graphing calculator. Just be aware that if you do that, you need parentheses around the entire numerator and the entire denominator. And um, it's, going, it's going to give you a decimal. It would give you negative 0.4. And then to convert that to a fraction, you would just have to go to math. And the first, uh, it's the first option under math, which is the little right arrow and then frac. And that'll convert it to the fraction of negative 2 fifths. OK. So now let's go ahead and move on. So top of the next page, we have uh, problem number three here. And in this problem, basically, you're given a speed or a rate, um, 1,500 meters per second. And it just wants to know how many meters, which is a distance, would the sound travel through it after a time of 15 seconds. So 
This is basically just, you know, rate times time equals distance problem. And so you're given the rate, which is 1,500. You can put the units if you want, but it's not needed meters per second. You are given the time, which is 15 seconds. And so you just go ahead and multiply those two numbers together. The correct answer when you go ahead and multiply this out is just going to be 22,500 meters. So it's just going to be letter B. Below that, we have problem number four. Uh, basically what's going on in this one is we have a rectangle and you know it's got a width and it's got a length and then the image is uh, resized but still the same shape still a rectangle but the new width is basically three times as large as the original width so if the original one is just width is W the new one's 3W so what does the new length have to be well so it's going to it's going to end up being 3L. So one way you can hopefully see this is just by looking that if the width, you know, is multiplied by 3, the length will have to have the same thing done because the image is remaining proportional. Okay? Because the, basically these two rectangles, you know, have to have the same general shape. In other words, they have to be similar to each other. However, if you did not recognize that, if you weren't sure, what you could technically also do is set up a proportion where you could say, okay, old width is W, new width, 3W. Old length, L, new length, well, that's what I don't know. Then you could, then we can cross multiply. So we could just get X, which is representing our new length. So down here, instead of, say, 3L, say we don't know it, we just this would be X. So now we'd have x times the old width equals 3 times the width times the length. And now you would just divide both sides by the width. And notice what happens. The width cancels out. And so now you would just get x equal to 3 times the length. Okay, so the new length is 3 times the old length. Correct answer is letter C. I just want to show you an alternate way that you could do this using the strategy of picking numbers. So now let's say I made the original width equal to 1. All right, That would make the new width equal to 3. And now let's just say hypothetically I made the original length up here equal to 4. And now uh, what we're going to do is basically we're going to find the new length just by setting up the proportion and then what we would do is we would go ahead and we would plug in the value of L to all these expressions to see which one it equaled. So uh, what I mean is old width 1, new width 3, old length 4, new length x. Okay, Cross multiply these we just get x equals 12. Okay, So down here the new length in this hypothetical scenario would have to be 12. So now when you go through each of these you're going to plug in 4 for L because that's what we said the old length was right here. So you just plug in 4 for L in each of these answer choices. Answer choice A is going to be 4 thirds, not correct. Answer choice B is going to be 4 minus 3 which is 1, not correct. C is going to be 3 times 4, 12, yes, correct and D is going to be 4 plus 3, 7, not correct. So that's an alternate way you could do this if you're confused by all of the variables like W and L and everything um, by, again, picking numbers, putting in actual numbers for the old width, new width, and old length. Again, then solve for the new length and then plug in the values of L, the value value that you chose to the answers to see which um, answer choice matches the new length that you found. Okay, the next two problems, five and six, both deal with this uh, set of data here on the right side. So in problem five, uh, you're just setting up a probability, which you know is basically just a fraction initially. Um, and so the percentage of participants who gave a rating of five would just be, first of all, on the top we would have two because the number of favorable outcomes, i.e. number of people who gave a rating of five up here is just two. On the bottom, we would put 11 because there are 11 total values, or in other words, there are 11 employees in the company. 
and then we would just convert this to a decimal. So you just divide that on the calculator. It's going to come out to like 0 0.18, 0 0.18. It's technically 0.18 repeating. And then that fraction just gets converted to a percentage. So it's like 18, you know, 0.18 repeating percent. So closest, you know, thing to that is just going to be letter B, 18%. Okay. Now for the next one below it, uh, problem number six. Here it wants to know the ratio of number of participants who gave a rating six or higher to number who gave uh, rating lower than six. So the first thing I would look at is the number of participants who gave ratings lower than six. So that would be only fours and fives. Notice there are three of them. So this is going to be initially at least something two, three, because there are that's the second part of the question. And for the first part of the ratio, well, there's going to be eight that gave six or higher. You could count them out, or you could just notice that there's 11 total, and three are less than six, then eight are six or more. So it's all these over here. So it's just going to be eight, two, three. And that's it. Letter B, nothing else. Um, to do for that problem. Now, continuing on to the next page, we have problem number seven here. Um, and in this problem, basically, you're given a you're given a bunch of graphs, and you're asked to identify which graph represents this relationship for this guy, you know, whatever, driving across the the country or driving to some race. And notice that they give you the equation of the function or the equation you know, of the line that you're looking for, which is just y equals 5x. So in slope-intercept form, you know, y equals mx plus b, we already know that the m or the slope is 5, and also we know that b is technically 0 because y equals 5x, the same as y equals 5x plus 0. That means the y-intercept of this line will be zero, i.e. it will intersect the origin, zero comma zero. So A is a possibility because it does intersect the origin. B is not a possibility. The y-intercept is not zero, zero. Get rid of it. C is not a possibility. Y-intercept is not zero, zero. And D is a possibility. So we're basically down to A and D. So now the question is, which of these has a slope of five or five over one? So let's just pick some points. In A, we've got 0, 0, and then to get to the next point, which is right here, okay, notice I go up 10. It's basically one block, but each block is 10. So it's like I go up 10, and then I go right 2. So 10 is my rise, 2 is my run. 10 over 2 just reduces to 5 over 1 or 5. So it looks like A is correct. Just to check D and confirm that is not correct, you know, starting here to get to the next point, we're going to go up 20 for my rise, and then we're going to go to the right 2 for the run. So this slope would be 20 on top, 2 on the bottom. That becomes 10 over 1, or just 10. So this one does not have the correct slope. Correct answer for this is going to be letter A. Also note, you could just go and graph the line on your graphing calculator, and then you could trace out or go to the table of values and see which of the, uh, on your graph, um, does it have like, you know, the point 2 comma 10, 4 comma 20 like A does, or does it have 2 comma 20, 4 comma 40 like D? That's an alternate way that you could figure out which line matches that uh, equation. Now, Next to it, we have problem number eight. So on this one, <clears throat> we have a soccer field, and we're given its area in square meters. We're asked to convert it to square feet. Uh, but this one's actually not very difficult because they actually give us the conversion between square meters and square feet. On more difficult problems, they would only give you the conversion between one meter and one foot. But uh, this one, it's actually relatively straightforward. So you could just use dimensional analysis, which is basically, okay, we've got 7,000 square meters, and we're going to multiply that by the conversion you know, factor, which is 1 square meter is 10.76 square feet. 
So this is how we'd set it up so that, you know, the meter squareds cancel out and we're left with square feet. And when you multiply these two numbers out again on a calculator, you're going to get 75,320 square feet. Correct answer is going to be letter C. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, if you're not familiar with, you know, dimensional analysis or doing unit conversions in the manner that I just showed, you could also set up a proportion. In other words, you could say basically 7,000 meters squared, okay, equals x feet squared. That's what we're trying to find. And then over here, we would put the meter squared on top, one meter squared, because we're setting up a proportion since they're on opposite sides equal sign, we need to have, you know, the same units say across the top and across the bottom. And then we would put here the 10.76 feet squared. And now would you cross multiply, you would again just to get the same thing, x equals 75,320 feet squared. So that's just an alternate way to set it up and solve it using uh, a proportion um, instead of, say, um, the first method that I showed. All right, moving on to uh, the next page. It's actually just zoom in here so it's a little bit larger, maybe easier to see. Okay, problem number nine on the left, here we are given another graph and of a line and we're told and we're trying to find the equation for this line. So notice a couple things here. First of all, the slope of this line is positive. Also notice the y-intercept is positive and specifically it's like just less than 400,000. So both of those are positive. So when we start looking at the answer choices, notice we don't even need to worry about the exact values um, initially because I can eliminate A because the slope is negative. I can eliminate B because the slope is negative. Notice here that, okay, T is basically on the horizontal axis, which is like our X, and D is on the vertical axis, which is similar to our Y. So the slope is going to be, in these answer choices, the number that's multiplied by the t or, you know, by the x, if you think of y equals mx plus b. So, okay, just right off the bat, look at the slope, we're down to c and d. And now, again, remember that the y-intercept is positive. Therefore, we can go ahead and we can eliminate answer choice c. So just by process of elimination, it's going to be d. Now... Again, another way that you could, uh, basically that you could do this is you could go through and you could try graphing these different lines on the graphing calculator, um, you know, each one of them and seeing which one looks the closest to the graph that's given. Um, or you can, a third way is you could actually pick just like two points on this graph. I mean, you just have to estimate the values essentially. Like right here, you know, you have whatever, 3,000, uh, 500,000, that's one. And then another one, you just, whatever, you'd pick it and you would just like estimate one of the values. And you could plug them in and you could do a linear regression. But you don't need to do all that because you can eliminate the three wrong answer choices just based on what you're shown directly in the graph. You don't need to do any more work, um, is my point, any more work than that. All right, next we have problem number 10. In this problem, uh, again, there are multiple ways to solve it. The first way I'll show you, which is what I'd say is the traditional way, you know, you'd be taught in like an Algebra 2 class or a Math 2 class, is to start off and square root both sides. And when you square root the right side, you get 9. And because you put in the square root, you have to make it plus or minus. And on the left side, you just get the 2x plus 1. Then you would set up two equations. 2x plus 1 equals 9. 2x plus 1 equals negative 9. And then go ahead and solve them each out. Actually, on the left side, sorry, this the the left side, uh, this thing is incorrect. This should be 8, not negative 10. It's going to be uh, negative 10 over here on the right. And then just divide by 2, and so we get 4, and we get x equals negative 5. Now, we should technically check uh, both of these just to ensure that they do work in uh, the problem when we plug them back in. And what that leads me to, though, is actually the second method that you could use to solve this problem, which is just back solving. And that means taking the original problem and just plugging in the answers and seeing which ones work. So for example, 
<clears throat> let's say I want to start with answer choice A. So I would take uh, 2 times negative 9 plus 1, you know, and I would square that and I would see, do I get 81? Okay, I do not. So what that means, oh, actually, I should redo that because I just noticed I didn't close the parentheses on negative 9, so that answer choice is actually incorrect. So let me just fix that real quick. Let me insert the parentheses. Okay, that is actually what you should get if you enter it uh, negative 9 incorrectly. It still doesn't match 81, though, so that means that answer choice A is wrong because one of the answers doesn't work, so you can eliminate that. Then you could go to B, and what I'm going to do now is evaluate it for negative 5. So we'll just change that to negative 5, and now hit enter. Okay, we get 81. Notice at this point, you could technically cross out D and C, and you know this has to be correct because it's the only answer choice with negative 5 in it. So when you're doing a test like the SAT, where there's a fixed you know, time limit, and you don't have a lot of time per question, if you were using this method and you checked negative 5 and that one came out correct, don't spend the time to check all the other, you know, possible answer choices. Like, we know this is correct, so we could go ahead and, you know, and move on. So, uh, this is just, again, a second method we could use in order to uh, solve this problem. And again, that is back solving or plugging in the answers. Next up, uh, the bottom of this page, we have problem number 11. Here we have basically a bunch of points or a scatter plot, and it wants to know, you know, which of these equations is an appropriate model for kind of like a best fit line, you know, for these. So like, whatever, something like that, if you were to draw it out. Okay, so first of all, notice a couple things. Again, the slope here is negative, and the y-intercept is positive. So let's go through and try to eliminate the answer choices just based on those two pieces of information. So anything with a positive slope, we can eliminate because we only want negative slopes. So we can get rid of A and we can get rid of C. And now we're left with B and D. Notice they both have uh, negative slopes and they also both have positive y-intercepts. However, notice that just this rough sketch that I drew, the y-intercept, you know, is somewhere up here, like, whatever, between 25 and 30. In other words, it's much closer to 30, which is the y-intercept in choice D, compared to 7, the y-intercept value in choice B. So B is going to be incorrect. Uh, letter D is going to be the correct answer. Now, I do want to show you just an, another alternate way that you could figure this out using the graphing calculator. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the stat menu and I'm going to edit a linear, uh, I'm going to run a linear regression. And I'm going to pick uh, some values here, some, po uh, some points, excuse me, not values, to, um, from the graph to go ahead and kind of plug in. So maybe I would pick, like, uh, right here I have 2.5 comma 10. And then maybe, let's see, right here I have 3.5 comma 5. And again, it doesn't matter, like, I'm not looking for the exact right answer when I do this. I'm looking for which one of, say, the answers is closest. So I'm going to enter in 2.5 so my first for my first x point and 3.5 is the x coordinate of my second point and now I'll enter in the corresponding y values so 5 goes with 3.5 and now 10 goes with 2.5 once I have that now I'll go ahead and run the linear regression Okay, so I got an answer of y equals negative 5x plus 22.5 because the a value is your slope and the b value is your y-intercept. So now if I just get, you know, just get rid of these uh, for now. So now if you look at, at all the answers, basically, you know, 
So, okay, which one has a negative slope? Well, it's either B or D. Again, you know, A is gone, C is gone. And now when you look, you're looking at which one is closest to it. So, you know, 22.5, much closer to 30 than it is to 7. And negative 5, much closer to negative 7 than it is to negative 30. So that's an alternate way that you could find, you know, an approximation of a best fit line uh, for the scatter plot, or basically for any for any scatter plot, or for any you know graph of a line um, that you're given in a uh, in a problem. Okay, at the top of the next page, we have problem number twelve. Uh, this problem really only requires one step. You know, you're just going to divide both sides by four. And that would just give you x plus 1 equal to 4. And that's your answer, letter B. Now, one thing to be aware of is uh, if you didn't recognize that, if you just instinctively distributed the 4 and then went ahead and solved for x, you know, basically you should have gotten x equal to 3. But then remember, it's asking for x plus 1. So 3 plus 1 is just 4. It's not a lot of extra work if you did it this way. Um, but you just do have to remember that you're going to take your answer you get and add 1 to it to get the final answer. So now uh, taking a look at the problem right next to it, uh, top of the right side, problem number 13. Here you just have an equation with two variables, but they give you the value of one of the variables in it. Basically, 8.96 is the density of copper, and that is just represented by uh, letter C, or the variable C in the formula. So all you're doing for this problem is you're just plugging in, okay, you know, 0.95 and then times 8.96 plus 0.05n equals 8.87, and you're just solving that equation for n, and that's it. So if you go ahead and do that, you know, this thing comes out to 8.512. Again, this is just solving a basic linear equation. Then you subtract that on both sides. You get 0.05n equal to 0.358, and then you just divide both sides by 0.05. So n comes out to equal 7.16. So the correct answer is just going to be letter C. Also note on this one, you could also run through the answer choices, and you could just punch them into the calculator. So in other words, you could just type in 0.95 times 8.96 plus 0.05 times, and then you would start with answer choice A, 0.09, hit enter, and C. Does it equal 8.87? If the answer is no, which it will not, you cross it out, you move on to the next value. And then you repeat the whole thing, and just now it's 0.05 times 0.47. Hit enter, it's not going to equal 8.7, you know, so on. And you repeat and just go through it until eventually you see that C is the correct answer. Okay, below that, um, at the bottom of the right side, we have problem number 14. Here we have seven items in a data set but one of them is an error, basically the 30. So it wants to know what happens to the mean and the median if you take away the 30. So first of all, let's take a look at the median. So let's look at the old and the new. So originally, there are seven items. That means if we cross out, you know, starting on each side, we end up with one item in the middle. So the old median is 71. Now, Get rid of that. Write this down here. So now if I cross out the 30, now I have six items. So now I'm going to end up with two items in the middle, and these would be averaged. But the average of 71 and 71 is just 71. So that means the new median is going to be 71 as well. So removing the 30 will not change the median in this set of data. Therefore, we can eliminate A, we can eliminate B, and we're left with, so far, C and D. So now the question is, what happens to the mean or the average if you take the 30 away? So notice that 30 is much smaller than all of the other numbers. So if you calculate the mean with the 30, and then you calculate it without it, the mean is going to increase. It's going to go up, because you took away a very small number. 
you know, specifically a number that is much smaller than all of the other existing values. So the correct answer is just going to be letter D. If you don't exactly see that or aren't, you know, sure of that, you could just punch in the seven values to your calculator, divide it by seven, get what the mean is, then just punch in the six values, divide by six, and see what the new mean is. And that would just confirm to you mathematically that yes, it will in fact increase. Now moving to the top of the next page for problem number 15, here we have a system of uh, basically linear equations except you're given one equation and you have to identify the second one based on the fact that there are going to be an infinite number of solutions. So since uh, the original given equation is in standard form and all the answers are in standard form, we're looking for an equation where the multiplier on the x and the y and the number terms on the right side are all the same value. Okay, so if you go through, for example, the answer choices, let's start with answer choice A. 4x minus 6, okay, and then positive 10. So notice here, like, this is multiplied by 2 this is multiplied by 2. This is multiplied by 2. Okay? Every single term is multiplied by the same number. That is what happens when you have an infinite uh, solutions case. Therefore, the correct answer to this one is going to be letter A. If you wanted to check the others just to confirm they don't work, notice that in B, it's like you have 2x to 4x, okay, is times 2, but negative 3y to positive 6y is multiplied by negative 2. So there are different multipliers for the x and y terms. Uh, so that's A. It's not, so first of all, it's not going to be an infinite number of solutions. And also, just to review, that means there's going to be exactly one solution. When the x and y have different multipliers, there is one solution. And for answer choice C now, it's like 2x uh, minus 3y and then equals 5. And then uh, for the answer choice, to check it, 2x minus 3y and equal to 10. Notice here the x and y both have multipliers of just times 1. But on the right side, we have a different multiplier. It is times 2. Okay? This is actually the no solution case. So this is obviously not the answer to the problem. But just again to review, when the x and y have the same multiplier, but the number multiplier is different, that is how you tell it is no solution, i.e. it is two parallel lines that will never intersect. And then d is going to be the same as b, because in d, the multiplier for x is just going to be 1, but for y, it's going to be negative 1. So x and y will have different multipliers, and therefore d would be a one solution case. So that's just a confirm that b, c, and d are all incorrect, um, you know, in addition to the fact that we obviously found a is uh, correct. You could also technically have taken each of these equations and put them in slope-intercept form, and then when it's infinite solutions, you're looking for basically the same equation twice. You know, you're looking for, if you look at the top one, it's going to be basically y equals, uh, let's see here, I think it's going to be 2 thirds x minus 5 thirds. If you go ahead and rearrange it, if you subtract the 2x over and then you divide by negative 3. So you could take all the answer choices and you could rearrange them and see which one gives you the, that same equation, but that's a lot more work. It's just easier to look at the multipliers on the x and y terms and number terms to get the answer. Now, looking at problem number 16, the bottom of the page, here we have an inscribed angle. That's what angle ABC is. Uh, inscribed angles mean that the vertex is on the circle. And when that happens, the measure of the angle is equal to one half the measure of the intercepted arc. So that's just this arc right here, AC. So in other words, um, the angle is 55. That is one half the measure of arc AC. Well, that means arc AC just has to equal 110. You know, you could just multiply both sides by 2. Therefore, correct answer is going to be letter B. 
and that's it. There's no other work for the problem. Just keep in mind that uh, this is an, again, this is an inscribed angle. That is different than a central angle. A central angle is when you have an angle with its vertex at the center of the circle. When you have a central angle, that angle has the exact same measure as the arc it intersects. So like this would be um, 110. You know, this angle in here would be 110 degrees, for example. Um, but that is not the same. Again, that's a central angle. That is not what we have in this case. In this case, we have an inscribed angle of 55. Now, moving to the top of the page, we have problem number 17. Here we have a system of uh, linear inequalities. And it asks which um, ordered pair basically is a solution to this system. So first, let me just clear off. Uh, some of this, we have some room. Okay. So this one, there's multiple ways you could do this. Uh, first method I would recommend is back solving, which is just to take the answer choices and plug them in. And the whole thing, and the thing is that the solution point has to work in both. Now, I'm going to start with answer choice A, and I'm only going to show you the work just for generally the one equation, or the one inequality, excuse me, that it does not work for. I'm not going to spend the time going through like all the ones that it does work for. So if you take answer choice A and you plug it into the second one, you would get 2 greater than negative 2 times 0 for x plus 4. 2 is greater than 0 plus 4. 2 is greater than 4. Is that true? And this is answer choice A. We're checking. Is that true? No, it is not. So eliminate it. Okay. Now for answer choice B, I'm going to look at the same inequality. So I'm going to plug in 0 greater than negative 2 times 1 plus 4. 0 greater than negative 2 plus 4. 0 greater than 2. Is that statement true? No, it is not. So eliminate it. Next, we are going to look at uh, let's see here. Now for this one, uh, choice C, I'm going to look at the top uh, inequality. So 5 less than 1 half times 1 for x plus 4. 5 is less than 1 half plus 4. Is 5 less than 4 and a half? No, it is not. 4 and a half, or in other words, 4 and a half is not greater than 5. So go ahead and eliminate it. And now, Basically, so we have D, we have answer choice B by just process of elimination, but just to show you that it technically uh, works in both. So for the first one, we have 4 less than 1 half times 2 plus 4. Or in other words, we have 4 less than 1 plus 4, 4 less than 5. That checks. And now for... Uh, the bottom inequality, we've got 4 is greater than negative 2 times 2 plus 4. So notice on the right side, negative 2 times 2 is just negative 4, and negative 4 plus 4 is 0. So notice we get 4 is greater than 0. That checks. That is true. Okay, that is the correct answer. However, here is how you could solve this on the graphing calculator. So what I'm going to do is, um, first, let me get some of the answer choices cleared up, just so we can see them again. Just so I know exactly, you know, what point, uh, what points, excuse me, we are looking for. Okay, so now, on the graphing calculator, go ahead, go to y equals, because I'm going to graph out each of these inequalities. So the first one I'm going to put, I'm just going to put it as x divided by 2 plus 4. And now I will change the inequality symbol to less than. All right, that is now done. Second one, I'll just change the inequality symbol first to greater than. And then I'm going to just type in negative 2x plus 4. Now we'll go ahead and graph each of these inequalities out. And what we're looking for is the one point that is going to be in the shaded region that overlaps them. Okay, so where the red and the blue overlap, that's the solution set 
to this system. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and just move my cursor around to look for the points uh, just to see where these various points are and see if they are in the solution set or not. So let's go to, okay, here we're at x equals 0. So let's try to go up to somewhere right around 2. Okay, so 1.95, and then we jump to this. So 0, 2 is like right around here. Notice it's only blue. It is not um, in the overlap. So therefore, we could eliminate, you know, A. Again, we're looking for stuff that's in the purple. So next, we could look at 1, 0. So, okay, now we got a y value of 0. And we want an x value of 1. So right here we go from like 0.98 to 1.06. So right around here is 1, 0. Again, it's only in the blue. It's not in the overlap. It's not in the purple. Get rid of it. Now we can go up to 1, 5. And when we get all the way up here, okay, here it's 5. And then here we're jumping between right around where 1 is. Again, this will be in the red, but it is not in the purple. It's not in the overlap. So therefore, we could eliminate C. And now for D, 2, comma 4, well, we could, first of all, go down. We don't land quite on 4, but we're pretty close. And now we'll just go over to right around 2. So here's 1.96. Here is 2.04. So right around here is 2, comma 4. That one is in the overlap. That one is in the shaded area. So that's the solution to this problem. Okay? And again, we could do that just by graphing out both inequalities on the graphing calculator and then seeing which of these points is in the overlapped region. On the next page, we've got uh, problem number 18 here on the left where they give us a graph um, and they want to know what the graph of f of x minus 2 looks like. So on this problem, basically, when you take f of x and you just put a minus 2 at the end of it, that just means that we're doing a vertical shift downward of, you know, two units. So every point is going to go down two units. So notice that this y-intercept here of 0, 2 is now going to be down here at 0, 0. And like this point of 1, 4 is now going to be here at 1, 2. So the points we're looking for on our answer choices are either 0, 0, or 1, 2. So answer choice A, does it go through the origin 0, 0? Nope, eliminate it. Uh, answer choice B, does it go through the origin 0, 0? Nope, eliminate it. Answer choice C, does it go through the origin 0, 0? Yes, so most likely this is correct. And D, does it go through the origin 0, 0 or through 1, 2? No, it does not. Also notice with C, it also does go through 1, 2 right here, in addition to the origin. So answer choice C is going to be the correct answer. And again, all that's happening in this problem is we take the graph and we're basically shifting it down two units. So I'm taking points on f of x, I'm shifting them vertically down two units, finding what the new points are, and then I'm matching those new points to the answer choices. Now, continuing with problem 19 at the uh, top of the right-hand side of this page. So, in this problem, what you basically have is an exponential growth uh, type problem or function because it's telling you that this uh, value of GDP is increasing by a certain percentage every year as compared to, say, a linear uh, function where it would be increasing by a specific a number or amount every year. So the basic setup of these is, you know, whatever, you have your function and then out front you have the initial amount or your starting amount and then that's multiplied by say like 1 plus r and then <clears throat> your exponent on that is going to be uh, like either t or if this exponent is going to be something in terms of time. Based on how it's worded, it could be like just t, it could be t over 4, could be 2t, you know, um, but the point is the time is what's going to be in the exponent. And this r in this case is the rate of growth. Whereas if it was a decreasing value, if it was exponential decay, so to speak, you know, then it would technically just be like 1 minus r inside here. So when you just take those numbers and plug them in, the initial amount is the 250.72. The 15% is just equal to 0.15. So inside the parentheses, it's really like the same as 1 plus 
0.15. So that just turns into 1.15 and then it's just you know raised to the t power for the number of years say after 1970. So the correct answer for this one is just going to be a letter D right here. Again this is just a basic exponential growth function and you just have to know you know how the function is set up where the different numbers and different parts of it go. Moving on to the next page for number 20 here you have a box and whisker plot uh, which you don't see a lot on the SAT but you do see occasionally. So <clears throat> you're asked to compare here basically two things the median and the range. So first of all the range is just going to be the difference between the basically like your high value highest value and your lowest value for each of them. So for the tanker let's say out here we have 400 down here it looks like it's going to be about uh, 20 because let's see 20 40 60 80 yep each tick mark is going to basically be 20 uh, number of fleets. So the range for this would just be 400 minus 20. Uh, and that would just be 380. So R equals 380. And then for the dry bulk, it looks like it's at 240, 60, 80. Looks like it's not quite 300. I mean, we can probably just approximate it to 300 because it doesn't, you know, it's not going to matter if it's off by a little bit. Um, and then down here, random, it's real close to zero, so let's just use zero. So the range for this one is just going to be 300 minus zero, which would be 300. So now it says, okay, which of the following measures is greater for tanker than for dry bulk? So is the range for tanker greater than dry bulk? Yes, yes it is, because 380 is greater than 300. So, so far we have two um, being correct, so we can eliminate A and we can eliminate D. You know, now we're basically just down to B and C, and we just have to figure out um, how the medians compare. So when you have a box and whisker plot, um, basically it's like, the whiskers on either end represent the bottom quartile or bottom 25% and then the top quartile or top 25% and then the middle 50% of values are what's inside the box and the line, the vertical line in the box is the median for that specific set of data. So for example for the tanker this line right here is the median it's like at between 160 and 180 and for the dry bulk it will be right here looks like it's between 60 and 80. So for the tanker we can clearly see that the median value where this line is is greater than that for dry bulk. So one will be true as well therefore the correct answer to this question is letter C both one and two are true. Now going down to the bottom of the page, problem number 21. Here you have a <clears throat> an equation and it asks for how many distinct uh, real solutions it has. So there's multiple ways you could do this. Uh, first thing, uh, one way to do it is, so this is actually almost completely factored. Um, if you uh, factor, if you factor trinomials, using the factoring by grouping method, you can actually factor this just by taking out an x minus 12 from essentially both terms out front. So you factor that out as a common factor and then what you're left with in the other parentheses will be the x in front here and then the minus 12 um, that's in front of the other parentheses. And now this is technically, you know, already factored and notice you get only one answer. There's basically one, uh, you know, real solution to this. It's just x equals 12. So the correct answer is going to be letter B. But now let's say you didn't realize that you didn't um, pick up on the fact that it could be factored that way. Okay, so then what I would do is, and let me just uh, delete this. So. Uh, we can see the original problem. If you instead went ahead and said, okay, I'm going to distribute here, I'm going to get x squared minus 12x and then minus 12x plus 144. 
Okay, x squared minus 24x plus 144 equals 0. Now at this point, there are two different methods you could use. Obviously, first you could go ahead and factor it, and you could just do, you know, trial and error, and you could say, well, it's got to be x and x, and the c term here, 144, is positive. That means both the signs will be the same, so either plus plus or minus minus. And since the b term here is negative, that means it's going to be minus minus. What are my factors of 144 that add up to negative 24? And you could go through the whole list, but it's just going to be, you know, negative 12 and negative 12. And you end up at the same spot, you know, where we were initially. Okay. However, you technically don't even, you don't need to do that. You could instead just go ahead and, like, after you multiplied it out and combined the minus 12x and minus 12x together, you could just go ahead and graph it. So, for example, let's say, first I'll set this so it's not an inequality, but it's an actual line. Okay, so we'll go ahead and we'll graph x squared minus 24x plus 144. And when it's talking about real solutions to an equation equal to zero, we're looking for the zeros. We're looking for the roots. So notice we can't quite see the graph here. So I'm just going to zoom out and redraw it just to get a, try to get a better picture of it and see. Okay. So now a couple things you could do. First of all, you could we could go over here and zoom in. It looks like it only touches it once, but I mean maybe. Uh, it goes, you know, underneath the uh, x-axis twice and comes up and, you know, hits it twice. But I'm just going to go ahead real quick and I'm going to zoom in, you know, right where it looks like the minimum of the function is. Okay, so now we could pretty much clearly see that uh, there's only going to be one real solution because it only intersects or crosses the x-axis one time. Again, you could zoom in even further just to con uh, just to confirm this. Um, but you could also go to again the calculate menu here, and we could go to zero. And now for my left bound, I'll just move to the left of it. For my right bound, I will move to the right of it. And now for my guess, I'll move in the middle. Okay, and it returns an answer. Notice it's technically 11.99993. It's really, that's a functional equivalent of 12 that we got. Um, but the point is, because this worked, because it did not give us an error, that, that's a confirmation that there's only one zero or one point where it intersects the x-axis and therefore there's one real solution. If it actually went down and then came up again and meaning that there were two different zeros, if I, what I just did would give me an error um, because it wouldn't be able to determine which one you wanted um, the value for. So that's just an alternate way you could solve uh, this problem as well. All right, moving up to the top of the page now. Problem number 22. This is another uh, kind of like linear equation interpretation problem. So you have the price of oranges. It's starting at $1.15 per pound. It's increasing by so much every month, and then eventually it reaches a price per pound of $1.41. They want to know what is the point zero six five equal? or not what does it equal, but what does it mean, essentially? What's its interpretation? So notice in the equation, this is like your slope. This is the number that is multiplied by the x, and where x is the number of months. So again, the slope is going to give you basically, you know, the rate of change in whatever your uh, you know, dependent variable is, or whatever your y variable is, which in this case is the total price, um, you know, of oranges, essentially, say, like this number right here. And it's going to give you that thing, again, as a, like, basically as like a unit rate. So, in other words, 0 0.065 in this context, in this problem, is basically how much um, the price of the oranges increases every month. 
So in other words, it's like it starts at 115 and then it goes up by 0 0.065, so like by six and a half cents. And that would be, that means the price after one month would be, uh, let's see here. If I set this up correctly, it should be uh, $1.20, basically 1.215 or like $1.21 and a half cents. And then the next month it would go up by another six and a half cents. And it would go up to technically 128 uh, per pound. You know, that's where it would be at. So when you go through the answer choices, it's obviously not A. That has nothing to do with like a unit um, rate or rate of change. Um, it's not B. It doesn't have anything to do with a percentage increase or, you know, average per pound price. Um, notice it's not D because D is uh, talking about the total increase in the price of oranges after some period of time. So it's like after whatever, two months, it would have gone up 13 total cents. For example, if you plugged in two for X and multiplied it by that, multiply it by 0.065, it comes out to 0.13. So D, <clears throat> if you plugged in two, uh, would give you 0.13 as the total increase, but that doesn't match the 0 0.065 that the actual number itself is. So D is, again, not correct because, again, it's talking about a total increase over a period of time, not a unit or rate increase. Correct answer here is going to be letter C. And, again, it's, already, it's basically what I've already explained. It's, you know, the rate of change in dollars in the average price, you know, per pound of oranges. So, in other words, over one, after one month, the average price goes up by 6.5 cents, and that's what... Um, that's basically what that number means. That's what the slope, you know, of this function stands for. Moving on to the next page in problem uh, 23. Here you have a geometry question. Uh, it's actually fairly, uh, fairly tricky. I'm just going to zoom in on this one just to make it a little bit larger and then uh, zoom back out after we're done with it. So we know AB is 6. And obviously, CD is 6. They don't technically have to tell us that because it's a rectangle and opposite sides of a rectangle are congruent. Um, we also know AC, the entire uh, side here, is going to be 10. So there's a couple different um, things that we basically could do. First of all, notice that um, you have a right triangle down here, ABC, and we know a 6. We don't know BC, but we do know the hypotenuse 10. So if you use Pythagorean theorem, you could just go ahead and set up an equation, you know, 6 squared plus BC squared equals 10 squared, or in other words, 36 plus BC squared equals 100, BC squared equals 64, BC is just going to turn out to be 8. It's, you know, 6, 8, 10, which is just a multiple of a 3, 4, 5 special right triangle. So this is 8, okay, and this is also 8. They want to know the value of uh, CE here, okay? So just this little side, so whatever, we'll call this um, X. Now, there are multiple ways that you could figure this out. Uh, one way is that this side over here, CD, which is 6, is technically the geometric mean between uh, the part of the leg of the right triangle. In other words, this it's basically the it's going to be the geometric mean between this side right here, which is x, and this entire side right here, which is 10 or AC. So the way you set that up when you have and this is just a thing you probably learn in geometry. The geometric mean basically goes down here. So 6 is the geometric mean, again, between like the entire, basically, hypotenuse of this triangle, which is 10, and also this uh, small part of it, which is closest to it. And then you could go ahead and you could cross multiply, and you get 10x equals 36, and you could divide by 10, and x equals 3.6. Okay. Now, one thing just to point out, that that whole statement about the geometric mean, that occurs when you have a right triangle 
and you draw the altitude to the hypotenuse. So in other words, here technically triangle ADC is the right triangle that we're looking at, and DE is an altitude to the hypotenuse, which is AC. So when you do that, that's what causes you to be able um, to use this geometric mean uh, property. An alternate way you could get this or figure it out is as follows. You could use uh, basically the concept of the idea of similar triangles and you could set up a proportion. It's actually going to turn out to be the exact same proportion that I had set up here with the geometric mean, but it's a little easier to possibly to think of it this way if you've never heard about the geometric mean or are not familiar with it. So just give me one second to clear some stuff out here uh, from the diagram. And so if you take the small triangle on the right, okay, so this is triangle DEC, and we have 6, which we know, and we have the X here. That's the value we're trying to find. Now I'm going to take this entire triangle on top, which is ADC, but I'm going to draw it such that it's like it's in the same general shape as uh, the, uh, the DEC so that the proportional sides are matched up. So obviously 10, you know, would go over here. Now 6 is the smaller side of, of CD, and that's, so that's just going to go down here. And then 8 uh, would go up here. Therefore, this is going to be, you know, vertex A. And down here where the 6 and 10 join is going to be vertex uh, C. And of course, the right angle is at vertex D. So again, all I did just now is I took this triangle right here. And I basically kind of rotated it so that it's upright. So this 8 side is now vertical. This 6 side is now horizontal. And 10 right here, the hypotenuse, um, you know, you can see. So now if you look at these two triangles, which will be similar, now what you can do is you can go ahead and you can just match up the corresponding parts. So you can say, all right, X side on the bottom here corresponds to 6, just like 6 corresponds to 10. Again, it's the same exact equation that I got initially, and you're going to solve it and get the same exact answer, which is, you know, letter A, the 3.6. But it's just an alternate way to think about it. It's just kind of showing you the geometric mean uh, proportion that I used. That's just basically a shortcut theorem in geometry. Um, so if you didn't know that or never learned that, technically where it comes from is you have two similar triangles and you just match up the proportional side. So there's the explanation for how you technically do that. Okay, now uh, let me just zoom back out a little bit here. And we'll move on to problems 24 and 25, which both deal with this chart of data over here on the left. So for problem number 24, customer buys four tires and gets the discount but doesn't have them solved. What's the cost? Well, this is just basically go ahead, multiply out the numbers, you know, blah, 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 plug it in, and then um, work it out on the calculator. So first of all, there are going to be four tires. So I'll put a four here. Each tire is originally $90, but each tire is 15% uh, off the list price. So technically, if you think back to a couple questions ago, the exponential growth and exponential decay, what that means is, the easy way to think about that is, basically it's going to be 1 minus 0.15. This is the shortcut formula or in other words, 0.85, you simplify it. This is the shortcut formula to find out what the final price of the tire would be rather than doing 90 times 0.15 and then subtracting it from 90. I'm just going to do it in one step here and do 90 times 0.85. So this is the price of one tire with the 15% discount, and then I'm just going to multiply that by 4. That's going to give me the total price, and it would be 306. Of course, we don't need to add anything because the tires are not being installed, so we don't need to worry about the uh, installation fee. So correct answer here is going to be letter D, $306. Now, for problem number 25, uh, this one, there are multiple methods you could use to solve it. So one way to think about this is... 
uh, just to set up some expressions for the revenue and the cost. So we're looking at store W. Okay, the total revenue that they would be getting, so I'm just going to use R for total revenue, would basically be 3 times and then A, which is the price of a tire. <clears throat> and then plus fifty dollars because that's the installation fee for four tires notice it's three times a and not four times a because it tells us if you buy three tires at the list price the fourth tire is free so whatever the tires cost they get that times multiplied by three and then add fifty that's the total revenue they take in for installing four tires now um, so that's the first part, sorry, that's the total amount of money received. Again, I'm just calling that revenue. Now for the expenses, well, they tell us in the problem, the expenses for selling and selling is $100. So the profit is just going to equal revenue minus expenses. So that's 3A plus 50 minus $100. Therefore, it is 3A minus 50. So the correct answer for this one is going to be letter B. Now, Here's an alternate way you could figure this one out by using the strategy of picking numbers. Let's just say that each tire costs $100. All right, so in other words, A is $100. The total amount of revenue the store would get would just be 3 times 100 and then plus 50. Okay, so that would be $350. Again, you could just do this on your calculator if you can't do it in your head then their expenses would be $100 that's given so total profit would be $250 now just go through the answers and plugging in 100 for A see which one of those answers equals 250 basically A is going to be 350 this one's going to be 250 and it's correct this is going to be it looks like 450 this is going to be 350 because 4 times 100 is 400 minus 50 350 so Again, we find the same correct answer, letter B. And this might be an easier way for you to understand if, again, the numbers and the, in the expressions and everything are confusing you. So just pick a number for A, plug it in, then calculate the revenue, calculate the expense. Well, you don't have to calculate the expenses. That's given. Calculate the profit to an actual number, and then plug that number back into the answer choices and match it. Next, we're going to take a look at problem 26, the top of the next page. So in this one, basically, uh, the height of a tree in 2016 was 1.35 times its height in 2011. So <clears throat> if you think about, again, the same thing with like exponential growth, right? So its height in 2016 was equal to 1.35 times its height in 2011. So I'm going to let x be the 2011 height and just y be the 2016 height. So <clears throat> notice that this 1.35 times could technically be broken up into 1 plus 0.35. And what that, that key is here, the 0.35 that's being added to the 1, you know, that is basically the percentage increase. That's like the exponential growth rate, so to speak. So that's one way that you could get the answer and determine that it's going to be just letter C, 35%. Because now if you would multiply this out, you would see that you just get X plus 0.35X. And so, you know, okay, we have the original height and then we add to it this new amount, which is 35% of it, okay. That's and then it gives us, you know, the new value, the Y, the 2016 value. So that's one method to do it. You could also use picking numbers for this, where you start with a number in 2011, you multiply it by 1.35, you get a new number, and then you go through and calculate the percentage uh, increase between them and get it that way using basically the percentage increase formula, um, you know, which is basically new minus old over old. So that's an alternate way that you could do it, but it's really not that much different than, you know, kind of the way that essentially I set it up uh, here. Next to that, we have problem number 27. Here, they're basically asking a question about, um, you know, a sample statistics and a sample size of a study. So 
the correct answer for this is going to be B. And the reason is because when you increase the um, size of a study, i.e. when you increase how many things are sampled in the study, you generally will decrease the margin of error that occurs in it. So very small studies have much larger margins of error compared to larger studies which generally have smaller um, margins of error. So that's just something to know or to memorize um, related to you know basic uh, studies um, and statistics and so on. There's no other real way to calculate again to, like to calculate it or these actual numbers they give you don't actually mean anything. This is just a general kind of idea or principle you know to know um, for the SAT. Going to the top of the next page we have problem number uh, 28 here. And in this one, so you have two different equations. One is exponential, one's linear. And <clears throat> it basically wants to calculate like the difference between them uh, three days after peak luminosity. So in other words, you're basically just setting D equal to three and you're plugging it in to both of these expressions and then just comparing them. And that's all that's going on here. I mean, it looks more, much more complicated when you uh, read through all the text, but it's really no different than taking the first one, plugging in three for D. When you do that, you should get 7.049. Again, just do that on the calculator, obviously. When you do the second one, again, you're plugging in three for D. You just do this all on the calculator. The number it comes out to is approximately 7.26. And then how much greater is the value for the linear equation versus the exponential? Well, just 7.26 minus 7.049. You subtract them. So based on my rounding, I got 0 0.21031. And so that's just going to be, you know, letter A. And even if you, depending on how you rounded or if your numbers were slightly different, like the scales of these numbers are so much different that, you know, whatever. If you got 0 0.20 or 0 0.22, A is obviously going to be, you know, the correct answer, the one that it's close closest to. Now, for problem 29, we have a probability uh, problem here. So first I'll show you kind of like the theoretical way to think through it, and then I'll show you an example with uh, picking numbers. It's an alternate method to use. So we want the probability of like not an orange. And we're selecting from apples and oranges and pears. So the denominator is going to have, you know, x plus y plus z in it. So we have because we have the total amount of fruit, which is all the apples and all the oranges and all the pears. And then you know, how many favorable outcomes are there? How many ways are there to not get an orange? Well, you have X apples and you have Z pairs. So this is technically, uh, <coughs> like, I don't know, the, the correct, an like this is a correct answer or, you know, this is one way to figure it out. But the problem is if you look at all these answers, um, none of them uh, match you know, the answer, uh, none of them match what we found. None of these answer choices match up identically with what we have here. So what they're actually doing to get the answer choices is to find the probability of like not orange. They're actually doing one minus the probability of selecting an orange because the probability of not orange or not selecting an orange and the probability of selecting an orange equals one because like those are the only two possible outcomes. Either you do select an orange or you don't. And so together, all the outcomes, you know, when you have a probability will add up to one. So the way they actually constructed it is they did one minus, and then the probability an orange, which is gonna have the same denominator, you know, the X plus Y plus Z, but now the favorable outcomes, what's the probability an orange? Well, it's just Y, you know, out of that. So this one is going to be letter D. 
Now, I'll show you an alternate method you could use uh, picking numbers here. So I said there were two apples, there are three oranges, and there are five uh, pears. And then what I said is, okay, well, what's the probability it's not an orange? Well, 2 plus 5 is just 7 out of 10 total things. Then we go through the answer choices, and we plug in these numbers, and we see which of these is equal to 7 over 10. So answer choice A, just check it real quick, x plus z, 2 plus 5 is 7 on top, over y3, 7 thirds, wrong. Answer choice B, x plus z, which is 2 plus 5, 7, 7 minus 3 is 4 on top, and then x plus y plus z, which is 10 on the bottom, wrong. Answer choice C, 1 minus y on top, so 3 over x plus z, 2 plus 5, okay, it's, so it's 1 minus 3 sevenths. Is that going to equal 7 tenths? Probably not, but if you were not sure, I'll just go to the calculator real quick just to confirm it. So 1 minus, and I'll just put in a fraction, 3 over 7. 4 sevenths. Okay, not 7 tenths. We have our confirmation there. And then letter D, 1 minus. Now, this is 3 over 10, so 1 minus 3 tenths, that is going to be 7 tenths. Again, if you were not sure, you could just go to the calculator. So instead of 1 minus 3 sevenths, let me just make this a 10 on the bottom. Okay, that equals 7 tenths. That's what we expect to find based on our you know, calculations. That's just confirmation again that D is the correct answer. So again, that's an alternate way to solve this problem using picking numbers. Now we have the last multiple choice question. Uh, from this section before the uh, you know the, the grid ends or the fill ins is problem number 30 and we have two sets of data here and it's asking questions again about range and also about standard deviation so again range we looked at before on the box and whisker plot you know the possible ranges uh, for Q the largest it could possibly be is say like 29 minus 5 for its range which would be 24 and even if you took the smallest possible values for P, like it would be 30 minus 4. So even if like all these 30 to 34s were all 30s, and even if all the 0 to 4s were all 4s, like the smallest possible range would be 26. So the range of P is greater. So data set P has a greater range. So when we go down and look at all the answers, okay, we can eliminate B, Q does not have a greater range, and we can eliminate D, okay? We want A and C so far because data set P has a greater range. Now, in comparing the standard deviation, so standard deviation is just a number, and basically it describes how far, how close or how far the data is relative to the mean, relative to the average. So the correct answer to this one is going to be letter A because in data set P, this data is much more spread out relative to the mean. So the mean is probably like whatever, somewhere right around in this, you know, this ballpark, this area. And notice there's a lot of values like up here pretty far away from it and also down here. Whereas in set Q, notice it's more isolated. It's more like tightly packed together, you know, closer to the mean. So data set P will have a larger or greater standard deviation than data set Q, um, because in data set P, the data is more spread out. In data set Q, the data is less spread out, or in other words, closer together. So data set Q has a lower standard deviation. So again, the correct answer is just going to be letter A. And um, the whole thing about standard deviation, again, that's just something to know, something to memorize, something to be aware of in terms of what the standard deviation is and how you can um, compare it uh, from two sets of data when you're looking at something like this where you have basically two uh, histograms.
For the first grading question here, uh, number 31 at the top of the page, uh, you're just asked to find the median of this dot plot. And since they tell us the number of uh, dots or values that are in it, this is actually very simple. There are 25 total values. That means that technically it's going to be the 13th value, which is the median. The way we know that is, you just take 25 divided by 2, that comes out to 12.5. You round that up to the next uh, whole number, and you always round up even if it's 0.5, whatever it is, for the decimal. Um, but the 13th value will be the median value. Basically, there's like 12 values below it, there's the median in the middle, and then there's 12 values above it, is another way to think of it. So we just go through and start crossing off 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So the answer to this is just going to be 9, and that's uh, just what you would grid in. On the next problem here, uh, you have this equation talking about um, you know mixing together like a 10 percent uh, salt water solution and a 20 percent salt water solution is going to produce you know whatever an 18 percent uh, thing overall and <clears throat> then they tell you that they're using 50 gallons of the 10 percent so this might look complicated but really all you're doing is you're just taking this equation and you're just plugging in 50 for x and then solving it for y so where we see x, which is the amount of the 10% solution, we just plug in a 50, and then we just go ahead and you can, uh, let's see, just multiply here to get 5, and let's make this 0.2y. Then on the right side, we just get 9 plus 0.18y by uh, distributing. Then we can go ahead and subtract over. So, so moving the y terms over to the left, we get 0.02y. Moving the number terms over to the right, we should get 4, and we just divide by 0.02. This, again, you can just do on a calculator, but it's going to come out to be 200. So, final answer that you would grid in is just 200. There are 200 gallons of the 20% solution used. Moving on to the next page, problem number 33. Here you have a line of best fit, and you also have some actual values. They want to know for how many of the points does the line of best fit predict a greater y value than actual. So in other words, they're asking for predicted value greater than actual. That means when you're looking at the graph, you're actually looking for the values that are below the line. Okay? So in this situation, you want the points or the values which are below um, <clears throat> the line. So therefore, there would be 1, there would be 2, and there would be 3. So the correct answer to this question is just 3, and that is what you're going to grid in. If it asked for the opposite, and it said for how many of the points does the line, were the, uh, you know, actual values greater than the predicted value? Or, were the, or another way I could word it would be the predicted values um, less than the actual values, then the answer would be 2. You know, then it would be the 2 up here where the actual is above the predicted. Um, but again, that's the opposite of what it's asking for in this question. Next problem, right next to it, 34. Uh, there are multiple ways you could do this. So essentially, the I guess would say the most straightforward way is to go ahead and just start factoring this. Um, first thing I would notice is that uh, each of these terms has a, not a 6, it's actually going to be a 3x that's in common. So we can factor that out, and then what we're left with is going to be 2x squared plus 9x minus 18. And now you could go ahead and factor this. You could do trial and error. You could do the AC method. Um, I'm just going to show you you know, how it ends up factoring, basically just to save time. It's going to be 2x minus 3 and x plus 6. And now, okay, it tells us in the problem, okay, if ax minus 3 is a factor, so it's going to be this one right here, okay, because this is the only factor that has a minus 3 in it. 
the x plus 6 obviously doesn't have that, and just the 3x alone doesn't have that. So, in other words, ax minus 3 matches up with 2x minus 3, so obviously a has to be 2. Now, if you're having difficulty uh, factoring this, I mean, an alternate way you could do this would be to go to the calculator and go ahead and just, first of all, graph out the function. So, for example, take the inside part, which is the 2x squared plus 9x minus 18. All right, and notice uh, we don't see a lot here. That's probably because my zoom, you know, is messed up from a previous problem. So let me just regraph it with a standard zoom. Okay, there we go. All right, so each of the zero points corresponds to, uh, you know, one of the factors. So, for example, if I go to zero right here, and let's say I want to look at this one on the right. So for my left bound, I'll choose here. For my right bound, we'll go up there. Okay, and I get 1.5. Okay, so that, that's the value I get for my 0. That means the factor itself is going to be x minus 1.5. And here's the other thing. Notice Oh, 1.5, here's what we have to do notice, have to notice 1.5 is very similar to 3, and if I just, you know, multiply this by 2, now it could become 2x minus 3, because the whole goal is, I'm looking for a factor that's something x minus 3, and this parenthesis that I got, just on the calculator, you know, this factor uh, can easily be made into a 3, again, by multiplying by a 2, and it ma now it matches the form that we're looking for. So then you could figure out now, oh, a has to equal 2. So that's an alternate way um, that you could get this, just if you were having trouble um, or difficulty, you know, with factoring, uh, with the factoring of the problem. All right. And you could also, actually, one other, sorry, one other thing I want to mention, too, you could actually have graphed out the original uh, function as well. You didn't even need to pull out a 3x because uh, that will still have the same zeros. I mean, if you graphed the original thing, the 6x cubed plus 27x squared minus 54x, there will actually be three zeros. So I'll just show you that real quick. It'll just cross at zero um, as well. But the 1.5 uh, zero will still be there and it will be fine. Um, it still be, you know, we'll still get the same basically answer we were looking for. So 6x cubed plus 27x squared minus 54x. So in other words, here I'm graphing just the original function that you're given. And now, if, again, if you go through the same exact process, so like, let's say, you know, whatever, I would go over to this one on the right here. Okay, so my, my left bound, I need to be below it. My right bound, I need to be above it. And then for my guess, I'm right in the middle. Okay, notice I get the same value. I get the x equals 1.5, which gives me the x minus 1.5 parenthesis, which I then convert to 2x minus 3 just by, you know, multiplying it by 2. And therefore, I get uh, the same, you know, factor, same answer. Moving on to the next page, we have problem number 35. So in this one, you have a set of numbers, which is all the positive integers that are less than or equal to 150. It's basically 1 to 150 is really what we're looking at. And we're selecting a number from random, and it wants to know what's the probability that the number is even and less than or equal to 30. So there are basically going to be a total of 15 even numbers that are less than or equal to 30. If you think about it, 1 to 30, there are 30 total numbers. Half of those are going to be even. You know, basically half are even or half are odd. So therefore, for a probability, 
the number of favorable outcomes is going to be 15. It's essentially, and you could just list them out and count them out if you wanted to, you know, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30. There's going to be 15 of them. And the total number of outcomes is 150. You know, it's all positive integers, less than or equal to 150. So this just gets reduced to basically 1 over 10, or if you just divide it on your calculator as it is, you would just get 0.1. So what you put in um, to, to grid in could either be 0.1, or it could be 1 divided by 10. You're not going to be able to fit in 15 divided by 150 because there aren't enough spaces, but either of these uh, answers would be correct. Next to it, we have problem number 36. Here they tell us that the uh, volume of a sphere is, you know, whatever, 20 uh, cubic centimeters. And then they tell us that the second sphere has a radius that is twice the radius of a sphere A. What's the volume of sphere B? So there are two different ways you could do this. The first method is to recognize that <clears throat> because the formula for volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed, when you take the radius value and you double it, so in other words, if I replace r technically with 2r and then I cube it, what happens is the r still gets cubed, just like in the original formula, but now the 2 gets cubed and therefore that turns into an 8. So now you end up with like 4 thirds pi and you have the r cubed, so all those things match, but you also have this extra factor of an 8. So for sphere B, it's going to be like the 20 centimeters cubed and then times 8. So it's going to be 160 cubic centimeters. So that's uh, basically 160 is what you're going to grid in. However, if you didn't recognize that, that's fine. You could then, you could instead go through the uh, little bit longer process of just solving for the radius of A, then doubling it for B, and then plugging that radius back into the formula and finding the volume. So just to show you real quick, you would basically set 20 equal to 4 thirds pi, you know, r cubed, and then you would basically multiply 20 by 3 fourths, and you would also divide that by pi, and that's equal to uh, r cubed. Then you would go ahead and just convert that to a number. It's 4.77 if you just do it out on the calculator. Then you take the cube root of it. Again, this can all be done on the calculator, and that comes out to like 1.683. So this is the radius for, again, sphere A. Now, Sphere B is going to have a radius which is double that. So that's just going to be 3.367. And then you could go back to the volume formula and you could say 4 thirds times pi times 3.367 cubed. And we just punch that whole thing into the calculator. And if you do it correctly, it should come out to be 160. So I'll just show you here real quick. I won't bother to put it as a fraction, I'll just type it horizontally. So we got 4 thirds and then times pi and then times 3.367 to the third power. And notice because of rounding, it's not, you know, exactly 160. If you had carried through the radius value from, like, the calculation on the calculator from previous steps, instead of just rounding it like I did, you would have gotten exactly 160. But it's 159.888, so it's close enough in this case, you know, that we would just round it up to get, you know, 160 as our answer. But that's an alternate method you could use if you were not sure, um, the using like the theoretical method to figure out uh, how much the volume is greater when you double the radius. All right, the next problem uh, at the top of the last page, problem number 37. And for this problem, you have to set up a system of linear equations. And the equations are going to look as follows. 
So the first equation would basically be, say, like x plus y equals 6. Um, and you could say x is the um, amount of time that she spends walking, y is the amount of time that she spends biking, and together they add up to 6 hours in total. Okay. And then the second one is going to be for the total number of calories that she burns. So the second one is going to be, say, 5.3 times x, and then 6.4 times y, and then that's going to be equal to 1,941. That's the total calories burned among both exercises. And so uh, the way we set this up is it's like 5.3 calories per minute, and then x is the number of minutes, 6.4 calories per minute while biking times y, uh, the number of minutes she spends biking, and then those will give us the total calories from walking and biking. We add them together, we get 1941. Okay, here's the thing though, and this is what makes this one tricky. So the first equation, technically when I set it up, since I set it equal to 6, x and y are representing the number of hours that she is walking and biking. But in the second equation, x and y are technically representing the number of minutes because the 5.3 and the 6.4 are calories per minute. So you need each equation to be in the same units. They either both need to be minutes or they both need to be hours. The easiest way to do it is to put them both in minutes because then all we have to do is take the first one and instead of having it equal to 6, uh, it's going to equal 360. In other words, I'm going to convert 6 hours to number of minutes, so I just multiply 6 hours times 60 minutes per hour, 360 minutes. So now these are the two equations you're actually going to use for your system of equations. Okay, now I would strongly recommend that to solve this, you just go ahead and use a graphing calculator. And I'm going to show you how to do it um, using matrix properties on a graphing calculator ra rather than actually doing out uh, the actual algebra. I mean, I'll just do the first step for the algebra, but I'm not going to go ahead and bother finishing it because we can do all this on the graphing calculator. It's so much quicker and uh, so much easier. So since they're asking for the number of minutes uh, that she spends bicycling, that rep that is letter Y in uh, these two equations here. So that means we want to solve for Y, we d and therefore we want to eliminate or cancel out X. So if you were going to solve this algebraically, meaning not on the graphing calculator, then I would recommend, you know, go ahead, multiply the top equation by negative 5.3 on both sides, and then after you do that, you add down the x column, it would cancel out, and then you, you know, add down the y column, add down the number column, then go ahead and solve for y, so on and so forth. Okay, but again, we don't need to do that. We can go to the graphing calculator. So first, I'm just going to go to the matrix menu, and then I'm going to enter in a 2 by 2 matrix. Okay, in those four spots, I'm going to put in the coefficients on the x and y from each equation. Okay, once I have them in, then I'll move my cursor outside. I will hit the x to the negative 1 button. Then I will enter in a 2 by 1 matrix, two rows, one column. Now I'll put in the two numbers. Again, make sure we're using the 360 that we converted uh, to minutes, not the original, you know, 660, or excuse me, the original 6, so that was ours. Now we just hit enter. Okay, there are the answers. The top number there is going to be the first variable listed, which in this case would be x, So, but we don't, we're not concerned about that. The second number is going to be uh, y, so Basically, the answer is going to be 30. She spent 30 minutes bicycling, and she spent or about half an hour bicycling. She spent 330 minutes walking. So 30 is the answer. You know that would be uh, filled in or gridded in. And again, the way I solved this system of equations was 
I went on my calcul uh, graphing calculator and I used basically what I did is I used properties of matrices. And if you'd like to learn more about how that works or you know how to do that, check out my other videos um, about uh, calculator hacks for both the SAT and also um, the ACT one, uh, ACT ones I have as well. All right, very last question on this April 2022 uh, test from the calculator section. Here you are given a quadratic function, i.e. a parabola, and you're given some basic information about it. It starts at a height of zero feet. Um, you're given the maximum height. You're given the maximum or the, excuse me, the time when that maximum height occurs, and they want to know what was the height uh, basically three seconds after it was launched. So this one is actually um, not that difficult. I mean, it does require a little bit of work, but if you think about basically the vertex form for a parabola, for a quadratic equation, okay, y equals a parentheses x minus h quantity squared plus k. X and Y is just, you know, any random point on the parabola. H and K is the vertex. The vertex of a parabola always occurs at the maximum or minimum point. So in this example, the 784 feet and the 7 seconds, that's going to be the vertex. Specifically, it's going to be the point 7, 784. In other words, this is the maximum of, this is the point that is the maximum of the function, and it is also, like I said, it is the vertex of the function. So 7 is equal to h, and 784 is equal to k. So we could plug that in. Now, after we do that, we still have to plug something in for x and y. Then we can go ahead and we can solve the equation for a. So here's where we use the fact that it's launched from a height of zero feet. That means when it is starting, before it's actually moved, i.e. when the time is zero, the height, or the, what essentially the y value, because time is basically our x variable here, is also zero. So we can plug in zero for x and zero for y. In other words, zero, zero is another point on this uh, quadratic function or on this parabola. So now we can just go ahead and simplify. So it's going to be a times just negative 7 squared plus 784. Negative 7 squared is 49. So I'm going to make that 49a. I'm just going to go ahead and move the 784 over to the other side. Then I will divide by 49. And for a, you should get the number of negative 16. So now we know what the function looks like, and it would basically be y equals negative 16 times x minus 7 squared plus 784. And so to find the height, which is basically our y, uh, after 3 seconds, we're just going to plug in 3 for x and then simplify that out uh, to whatever number you know it comes out to, and that's going to be our answer. So in other words, replace x here with 3. And now I'm just going to do this entire thing on the calculator. So I've got negative 16, and then 3 minus 7 quantity squared plus 784. All right, 528. So it looks like our height, 528 feet. Um, three seconds after it was launched. So 528 is just what we're going to grid in as the final correct answer. So uh, this concludes the calculator section from the April 2022 uh, QAS, you know, SAT uh, math test. Have any questions, comments, or thoughts on any of these problems or any of the uh, you know, solution methods that I showed here, please feel free to leave them below. Of course, if you like this video, please click the like button. Also, uh, subscribe, you know, to my channel, sign up to get notifications for whenever I post a new math video. And if you haven't done so already, check out the uh, solutions to the no calculator section, which were posted a couple days before this one was. Otherwise, um, there should be another new math related video, uh, coming out in a couple days. So that's it uh, for this one.